Um, hi, I'm Rick Schaefer. Um, I have some pieces in here. We'll talk a little bit about more of the history about all this uh, down at the studio. But the pieces that I have in here are really quick little uh, studies of various things that I've worked on. And uh, these three pieces are studies for a new piece that I'm going to start as soon as the art trail's over um, of kind of a Dutch. Flemish landscape floral arrangement, but in a storm. So if you can picture uh, paratulips and the whole thing, but just being blown by, by a storm. So <clears throat> to get that energy and try to figure out what kind of mark making I'm going to do for the, for the bigger piece, I did these little studies. And the blue won't be in there, but the blue is fun to do just for the evening. So I uh, look forward to talking to you down at the studio. So when I was talking about the two, the little pieces in the uh, 10 by 10 show, those were little uh, studies. And here's one more study. I'm working on a piece now, which isn't in here because it's raw charcoal. And uh, it get, tends to get touched during open studios. But um, I'm working on a large piece, as I said, that's floral in a, in a storm. So I did a whole bunch of these little sketches to try to get a handle on the, the technique and the vernacular of the mark making. And um, I work primarily totally now practically in charcoal. Um, and I didn't, in my practice, I've never worked in charcoal up to about five years ago and then suddenly discovered it. I always thought it was real messy, which it is. It's supposed to be kind of a wonderful media for smudging and really working. But I wanted something really crisp and um, defined. So I wanted to, I want the line work that I'm using to really show up in the final piece. And in order to do that, it, it has to be, um, I have to be very careful when I'm drawing and everything like that. So um, unlike Lauren, who likes to make a mess, I like to keep it really tidy. Um, and the mark making was what I had to discover. When I, when I first started doing charcoal, I had to figure out, OK, charcoal's great, but what kind of um, language for the mark making am I going to use to describe the kind of detail I want to use, but still keep that kind of fluidity and that open drawing feeling that I really liked in, in other drawing, uh, where you get to really see the process. It's not photorealism. If you come up close, it's really uh, gestural, and the marks are kind of almost uh, frivolous and, and, and uh, abstract. But then when you back off, it coalesces into a really cohesive uh, piece. So this is just a good example of Mark making gone berserk, kind of uh, really over the top um, line work, practically going blind doing this piece. Um, it's just, it's got, for me, it's got wonderful detail and texture, but since I'm drawing it up close, it's, it's almost impossible to figure out what it's going to look like when you, when you step back, because I'm drawing on a table instead of on the wall. So um, this kind of uh, conversation that I'm having between what works up close and what's going to work going back, backing off from the pieces when it eventually gets shown is, is the fun part for me. And, and I, keep the mark, I keep the process going actually very quickly um, in order to keep that spontaneity of, of the charcoal happening. So uh, just one, one more piece here. Um, this is part of a series I'm doing, and everyone says, well, you're black and white. Do you ever do color? This is about as colorful as, except the, <laughs> the blue pieces that were in the show. Um, this is just introducing some pastels and some chalks. And here, I'm, I'm working on a synthetic vellum, which has got a beautiful tooth to it. And it also has the beautiful property of being able to let, be left out in the elements. Um, once it's fixed, uh, the humidity doesn't affect it, and heat and sunlight and everything. So they're very, it's a very uh, stable uh, medium to draw on. One other aspect of it is you can come in from both sides because it's translucent. And here I've painted from the back, drawn from the front, painted from the front, drawn from the back. And I can keep going back and forth, and it gets that kind of a weird um, uh, layering that you might get in some, sometimes in encaustics or something like that. So. That's, that's a lot of fun. Um, and uh, I, I adhere to this kind of, as you can see, there's a lot of uh, 
16th, 17th century vernacular here in the drawing, um, and also the technique, which is a lot of cross-hatching, which comes from woodwork, durs, woodcuts, and stuff like that, um, or engravings that were the, the primary means of uh, reproducing paintings in before photo uh, copying, uh, photo reproduction came into play. And all those used very uh, uh, distinct mark-making techniques where the lines were all curving around the surface and giving a sense of volume to what could be a, a fairly flat piece. Um, so the lines don't just go like this, although they're doing that in the sky because it's more, but they kind of curve around each piece. And that's, that's a very classic way of uh, adding volume to a drawing. Um, so there's a lot of pieces in here, but we're you know, just going to talk about a couple. So um, this piece is part of that series. Uh, this is the expulsion from the garden. And so Adam and Eve, uh, here representative skeletons, are uh, being thrown out of the garden. And um, looking back, this is a classic pose that's been used by Michelangelo, Titian, Raphael, of uh, the expulsion where either Adam or Eve is doing this kind of lament uh, pose as, as they're being thrown out. Um, why the skeletons? It's kind of a, 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 a modernist play on an old theme um, of just showing that the clock's ticking. Once they leave the garden, uh, you know, now they're in a, a mortal sort of reality and uh, their lives are kind of uh, in, a, in a time frame that uh, has a beginning and an end. And this, this idyllic kind of uh, existence of, of, uh, of early creation where it's, uh, you know, uh, limitless, uh, time doesn't, it doesn't matter, doesn't have an effect, is suddenly uh, cast out. And so the reality, this, this bridge is kind of rickety, the skeletons, there's, there's a tree stumps. Reality starts to set into that kind of primal uh, bucolic scene of, of the Garden of Eden. Um, and again, uh, the style of the drawing is very much bar both contemporary, I think, in the, in the rendition, but also borrowing from the, from the 17th and 16th and even up to the 18th, 19th century for the Romanticists. Um, so, any questions? Yes? So, I get a sense that you kind of explained the background of that. Is that like the River Styx or the, 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 paint, uh, the work that you're in front of now? So, this, this, this title is The uh, Judgment of Paris. So, um, again, mortals, the, uh, in mythology, uh, the god, goddesses were arguing about who was the prettiest of them all. Uh, came down to the three. Um, the gods went out and found poor old Paris, uh, a mortal, to judge them. And so he judges them. And, th and the backstory of this is that he picks the one that promises him Helen of Troy, but she's married. So hence then you get into the whole Trojan War problem. So there's a, there's a kind of built-in narrative to this piece that um, I, I liked. Uh, nobody will know it. I mean, well, some people will know it. Uh, but, but, it, but it has a nice uh, continuance where a, a bucolic scene then leads to events that create kind of a cataclysmic wartime. I think I've seen your face in a few paintings. Yeah, yeah, I sneak in every now and then. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Huh? Why does it have significance? It's, it's, it, no, it has no significance at all. Um, it's a long, hallowed tradition of throwing yourself in. So, uh, okay. yeah, I, I avoided it for a long time, and then I thought, oh, I won't. <laughs> and for the Refugee Trilogy, which we'll see in the other room, I grew my hair down. I had a straggly beard. Uh, I looked like, you know, I don't know, some poor guy you'd see in the park. But, um, and so I, for that look, so that I could do, I could work myself into the, 16th century, which you'll see, 16th century uh, characters that were from Rubens and from Titian and stuff like that. The piece in the, right here, which we won't see, is a self-portrait as Don Quixote uh, with the armor and everything. And that's just a play on the fact that I had this passion for saving rhinoceroses and 
there, and uh, so there's a little rhino in there. <laughs> the, the impossible dream of saving rhinos. This is a little complicated to explain, but this piece here is one third of a triptych that will join three triptychs that are now in a traveling show across the U.S. Uh, that I started uh, a year and a half ago on the refugee crisis um, when it was first cascading on us. And um, it, rather than choose, everyone's kind of perplexed, rather than choose um, contemporary imagery, I decided to go back to the Baroque and pull from Rubens, and it's mostly Rubens, there's some Titian and some Raphael in here, um, use 16th century imagery to try to describe the, the chaos and the torment and everything that the, the refugees were going through. So what you're seeing here, the three pieces that I have shown and that are shown now, it's uh, in the Midwest, going out west, and then going to Florida, um, were about the, tra the journey that refugees take. So it was the, the classic image of the refugees stretched out on a highway, carrying everything they can carry, uh, then getting in a boat, some kind of boat to, to travel across a, a body of water, and a very perilous journey, and then meeting, finally landing and trying to get through some border of the next country that they're trying to get into and the chaos that that usually ensues. So I always felt that it needed a beginning and an end, that, that journey. So this is uh, a piece of the beginning. So this is just to describe chaos, warfare, uh, pandemonium, whatever drives refugees out of their security of, of their homeland and makes them travel somewhere. So this is just one of those um, this is in the, almost in the tradition of um, 19th century historical paintings where there was just big, uh, big uh, paintings full of uh, pathos and action and everything. Uh, Raft of the Medusa comes to mind, uh, um, a lot of uh, Jericho. Um, so this is the beginning piece. So what you're seeing on what we just saw was this left side here. And then I will do the two uh, other panels for this triptych, and the piece will end up being uh, 8 feet by 15 feet or something um, to match the first three. Um, and here, I've thrown everything together. You, you would never see angels punching people and getting into, <laughs> getting into, a, getting into a brawl with people. But uh, here, everything is just happening. Animals are involved. The dogs, as you can see. Um, I get in there a little bit. <laughs> um, so it's just, it's just chaos on a grand scale. Both the heavens and the earth and everything is just involved in this uh, chaos pandemonium. Um, I don't usually do studies this detailed. I don't feel it's, it's just kind of getting into the time that I have to do. But um, I figured I would on these two because I'm trying to actually get some funding to finish this series. So I needed to show them a little more in depth than I normally do. This would be, so this is called prologue. This is called epilogue. They'll sandwich the three pieces that I've already done. This is where they finally get to some place and they're trying to rebuild, trying to get their lives started again. Um, it's only males, which you know, it's, you know, I'm aware of. Uh, the women obviously are crucial to the whole, to the whole journey and, and to the whole rebuilding and effort and everything. Uh, but there's just these great massive uh, Rubenesque guys that were in the raising of the cross, and this is uh, Titian's uh, uh, Sisyphus carrying the rock. Uh, these two were carrying the, I think, uh, from the deposit from the Christ uh, coming down from the cross. This is from um, Rubens, um, the fl the uh, striking of, of Christ, uh, and then there's these elements twenty twenty. 20th century elements brought in, the steam shovel, the turnbuckle, uh, the guy on the crane uh, next to, you know, 16th century armor. Um, so, and, and, and conspicuously in the background is, is Bruegel's Tower of Babel, which to me just signified that even though there's a rebuilding process going on, there's always the potential, humanity always has the potential of screwing it up and, and making some big a mess of the whole thing. So that's just a warning kind of cautionary tale in the background. Um, 
So a lot of these have, I won't get into a lot of it, they, they, a, lot of have, a lot of them have specific energy, a lot of spe specific, specific direction that the, the action is taking, and that's uh, the difficult part of drawing from old paintings and trying to make them work in a new context, in a new, you're basically taking old actors from other plays or movies and putting them into uh, a new uh, a movie, um, but making them all work as a unit when they were all in different contexts and everything. Uh, that's part of, the, part of the real issue, part of the real uh, challenge of, of putting these big pieces together. So I'll stop babbling on. And so Rick, I'm yeah. curious when this started, your, your, your working with 16th, 17th century just artists with the, and technique? Was yeah, it? just with the uh, refugees. Um, I don't know, I think I'd been up to Yale and I saw some um, Last Judgment pieces that were also 16th, 17th century. And they just had that right kind of chaotic, right. awful, you know, challenging, you know, uh, mess of humanity that we're involved. So I thought, well, I just, I can't do better than that. So I'll just. <laughs> now you moved um, this series apart. The ones we saw in the next, in the other room, with the skeletons, sort of have moved. <laughs> you were still yeah. Yeah, yeah. somehow Well, I'm not going to continue using, uh, this was just for this particular project. Yeah. So I think this kind of using the, I mean, Rubens was such an incredible, I mean, whatever you think of Baroque art, then, you know, it's certainly gotten a bad rap ever since abstract expressionism came in. Um, it's just gorgeous what he does with the human body. Um, I like it in black and white. I always like the, uh, the engraving renderings of his paintings sometimes. Uh, he, he, he's a beautiful colorist, but um, I like the black and white a lot. So uh, I don't, I'm skirting your question. I'm not... So the work with the skeletons, uh, you're still then using um, Baroque 16th, 17th century techniques yeah. and, and actually engaging some of the subjects as well. Yeah. So are you disappearing into the <laughs> into that century? <laughs> uh, no, no, I'm doing, uh, well, uh, no, maybe I am. Uh, I'm doing, a, the piece I'm doing now is, is uh, like I said, the floral and it has a lot of uh, notes of Flemish. <laughs> okay. I'm, I'm hooked on the. I think I'm part Dutch or something. But uh, there's a lot of there's a a lot of this. Uh, they were the masters of of still life, of floral still life, and so there's a lot of that sort of in there. But I'm trying to I'm trying to drag it all and put it into a you know contemporary context. Question: um, What do you do to refresh your visual imagery bank? Do you go to a museum and look at, or do you look at books? Do you look online? Do you look at all, or is this all from your recollection of past? No, I do all that. Um, I think the, it's great looking at the originals, um, because then you can really stick your nose up, and somehow the, the viscosity of paint or the drawing itself or something, you get really, it's, it's enriching just to see the originals. But, I, but, you know, we're lucky now that we have the internet in a way for artists uh, that are doing figurative or, or representational art because there's such a wealth of stuff out there. Um, so I just grab, I know, you know, I guess I know where to go, but I grab stuff and, um, and the contemporary stuff, I'm just sort of making up a lot of it. So, you know, filling in the gaps. I may find a, uh, a tree I like, a part of a tree, and then I, I need a, ocean behind it, enough, you know, something. So it's, it's that kind of magpie jumping around, grabbing stuff. Yeah. Going back to the refugee story, how do you end the story in the third part of the trilogy? The trilogy is just, the trilogy ends, the three pieces that I originally did, ends with a border confrontation. So they're at a, some kind of demarcation where they're leaving one safe, they're leaving their country or another country and trying to get in, like you know, what happened in Europe and what happened in Turkey, what happened all over, where, where people are trying to not let them in or let them in and there's always this kind of chaotic, chaotic confrontation. That's where the story would go in though. But that, that's why I did, yeah, yeah. that's why I, I felt that it was always kind of um, left hanging and uh, this doesn't really wrap it up cleanly. It, you can't wrap it up, but um, it's, this was an attempt to sort of put bookends on that 
on that part. Yeah. Rick, a, a simple question. So when we look at the first, is, is this the first piece of the trilogy? Is this no. the? Well, this, yeah, this will be the first part of the first piece of the trilogy. From the moment that you put your first stroke on this work, how long did it take you to, for it to come to fruition? It's so detailed. Yeah, but um, I work very quickly. It's very gestural, the marking, so it doesn't go, it's not as slow as it would seem. Um, but it, yeah, it takes a long time. I think the original three huge pieces took six months. Um, this probably took a few weeks or a month. Um, so these little guys take, I mean, I can't draw small anymore. And this to me is small. So. Um, it, it, I don't, I just don't, I don't enjoy as much as getting really big and so uh, these take, these actually take longer. Okay, great.